Uh, hey, Pete, what are you what are you working on? So I'm spending a bunch of time, um, you know, at home like everybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm doing a bunch of writing, doing some angel investing, uh, and I'm actually doing a bunch of gardening as well. Uh, and so I've taken this time to like kind of reboot my garden. And one of the problems that I have that's driving me crazy is raccoons. Mm. So I'm in San Francisco and there's a lot of raccoons in our neighborhood that are just like tearing everything up. And so I view this as an opportunity to play around with, um, uh, Pete Warden has this great book, um, uh, Tiny ML. Oh uh, yeah. And it uses TensorFlow Lite. Um, and so I'm gonna play around with that. And actually there are these robots so you can get these on Amazon or from Walmart or something. And so it's really cool. It's called Mechamon. So the company, unfortunately, no longer exists, um, but you can get these uh, uh, kind of cheap. And uh, somebody did some Bluetooth sniffing and uh, actually put out a Python API. So you can actually control it. It's got servos. It's pretty robust. It can move pretty quickly. Um, and so I'm going to do a project to make these kind of sentinels in my backyard to protect the garden from raccoons. Hopefully non-lethal. Non Protect. Uh, protect. Protect yeah, and yeah, right. serve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Non-lethal. But I think raccoons, they're afraid of things like dogs. So if I can get this to like bark like a dog, maybe that would that would do it. I feel like the San Francisco raccoons are afraid of nothing. I don't know. I'm curious how this goes for you. But man, I gotta show you what I got a I got You got, you I got, got the same book. book. <laughs> so <laughs> this is not quite as big or um oh. <laughs> I put this together myself. Um, pop some kid off Alibaba, so yeah. Oh, by, by the way, I have another link. There, there, I found it just like this week. There's an open source project called um, Spot Micro. And so if I go and buy a 3D printer, I could put this, put it together, but it's like an open source Spot Mini. Um, and there's actually, I think it might've been OpenAI or somebody else. They put it in the, you know, the simulation framework. So there's oh, a cool. model. In the Joko? Yeah, I think it might be. Yeah, so you can actually s train it in a you know simulated environment, but Whoa. I think it's still very nascent. I don't. I haven't seen an actual working <laughs> video of this thing working. So I think people are still trying to build it. It's not quite working yet. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show where we learn about making machine learning models work in the real world. I'm your host, Lucas Bewell. Pete's been working in data and ML for a really long time. He was the former head of data products at Workday. Before that, he founded a deep learning startup called Skipflag, which was actually acquired by Workday. Before that, he was a principal data scientist at LinkedIn, and he's done a bunch of other awesome stuff. I'm really excited to talk to him. Kind of wanted to start off with like kind of going back to your um, like first job where you're doing like ML data science. I guess maybe even before um, LinkedIn, like AOL, I think it, it was right. Like, um, well. Yeah, even even before that. So I think when we met, I was I was at AOL or just finishing up at AOL uh, Search, um, and so that's an interesting conversation that in and of itself. Um, I was working on the search team there. Uh, I had just started, um, uh, came came there from MIT, uh, and the week I started, there was a release of user search data. So oh, and Ab Abder, pretty, man, we got to get him on yeah. the podcast. Oh, yeah, Abder, yeah. <laughs> so that was we weirdest first week on the job ever, for sure. Um, uh, everything was in disarray uh, when I started. Um, but uh, going back, so first, first job, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I worked in physics and neuroscience. Um, and so machine learning was, I think, kind of seen as voodoo to, to those folks back then. So there was this thing called, uh, you know, you would do deconvolution of signals. So I worked on a project. Um, it was a summer project. We were working on antimatter, which is it just sounds cool, right? Uh, but uh, positronium is um, it's it's basically um, a positron and an electron to, that forms uh, an atom, kind of like hydrogen, except with matter and antimatter. Anyway, long long story longer. The hard part was you're taking these measurements, real world sensor data, uh, you're trying to detect the decay of this atom, right? Because when the positron and electron um, are near each other, eventually they annihilate, right? And it gives off radiation. Um, and so you have all these sensors and, and equipment set up to measure that annihilation. But the problem is all the, everything that you're using to measure, um, it, it pollutes the signal, right? So what you actually measure is this convolution of the raw data with those signals. And so at the time, you know, my, my task, one of my projects was to deconvolve that signal. 
So deconvolution is like, you know, it, it, it is one of the uh, kind of core machine learning problems uh, from back in the day. Uh, it's kind of like the cocktail party problem. You have a bunch of people speaking and you need to disentangle who's, you know, the different voices in a recording. Um, anyway, so that's actually where I think I first, that, that and the work that I did in uh, neuroscience, I was really interested in neural networks basically, right? And um, interested in, uh, you know, process, I, I found the processing of the data more interesting than the actual experiments, which are, you know, a lot of hard work and um, a lot of time in the lab. Uh, so I really just dug deeply into signal processing uh, and machine learning. Um, and so before I, I got to AOL, and uh, I actually had two other roles um, where I cut my teeth on big data sets. The, the first one was actually back in the first dot com uh, crash. Uh, it was a company called Profit Logic, and they were, ended up getting acquired by Oracle and became Oracle Retail. Um, but we basically, this was back in the day when they'd ship the data to you on tapes. So uh, if you had a customer uh, you, to get access to their data, people say it's hard right now to get access to customer data when you're dealing with enterprise customers. But back then, we actually had to get tapes of data sent to us. Um, and so a lot of point of sale data, retail sale data. And we were building predictive models um, for retail sales. Um, and then I worked uh, in biodefense at MIT, um, which is unfortunately a relevant topic today um, uh, with the pandemic happening. Uh, but we were working on you know, these kinds of things, how to detect and measure and prevent um, uh, these kinds of uh, things, both uh, naturally occurring as well as you, know, uh, you can imagine a terrorist attack. Um, mm -hmm. with some kind of weaponized uh, uh, bioagent. So like, um, so doing predictive modeling um, in the first dot-com boom. Um, yeah. What's, I mean, so you get tapes, like how, how big is the data? And like, what is your, what kind of models are you building? What's your like tool yeah. set like? I mean, I've got to, that's a long time ago. So I got to, thinking back, you know what's funny? We were actually using Python, right? So we were using Python and C++. And so... At that time, I think almost nobody was using Python, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, Google, well, uh, Google, right? Google. That's right. So Google, it was it was kind of Google, and then like a handful of other startups around that, uh, you know, late '90s, uh, early 2000s. But in the enterprise, Python was not uh, really widely adopted yet. Um, but you know, this was really uh, you know close to the metal uh, kind of work because you know you'd get the data. I, I don't remember the exact volume. But you can imagine like a customer like Walmart, right? You know, they have uh, thousands of stores, uh, uh, thousands of products, and each of those products has different sizes and colors and styles. Um, so those SKU, it's really at the SKU store level was the, the granularity of data. Um, and then every transaction. So similar to, you know, what something like Square might have now, right? Where you have, you know, somebody buys a coffee, you get that transactional event. Um, but at the time, you know, the lag was really long, right? So these are brick and mortar retailers. Um, and so they were mostly running on Oracle or DB2 or something like that. And they would have, you know, their point of sale system. And then that would be aggregated up, um, all that raw data usually to something like, you know, this shirt there, it would be a SKU. Um, and if you look at the sales of that SKU, you could see the sales uh, nationally, um, and then typically what would happen is, you know, there's markdown. So two weeks in, you lower the price and then there's a sales bump depending on the elasticity of the item, the price elasticity. Um, and so really the machine learning problem there was, OK, the first few days, actually, I think we cut it pretty close. So we had a week turnaround time. We would get the raw data and then we would run our models. So some Python and C++ models to do forecasting and optimization and model fitting. Um, and then we would basically want to spit back price recommendations. So for every SKU, we're saying, we're telling the retailer, Hey, mark it down 10%, mark it down 15% so that you'll optimize sales over the entire season. Um, and many times what that, what ended up happening is it would take, you know, a few days to load, load the data. We'd have to get the data uh, from tapes. So we'd have to load it. There could be an issue there. Um, then you have to get it into our models, run the models, which would I, I think that could take like a day or two at that time. Um, and then at the end of the day, this is going to sound really bad. 
Um, but QA at that point in time looked like, so the final product we would send was basically a CSV report that would go to the retailer that they would then put into their point of sale system or their buying system. Um, but there were some nights where we actually would just print out the CSVs and like, look at them and, and then mark, Hey, this looks wrong, <laughs> you know, with the marker and then yep. go back and actually go in with Python and, and, and fix and change the models. Um, wow. and those are late nights. And what was your title at that point? Like, what did they call you? I think back then it was kind of like being a glorified grad student, but I think my <laughs> title was, uh, analyst or data analyst, but, uh -huh. um, data scientists didn't come around until what, like t 2009 or 2010. Right. So, but that was basically like a data scientist. And then, but then you, you actually were on the, you were one of the original data scientists at uh, LinkedIn in the early days. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with a, a team, like a team that I think everyone's gone on to do, um, really awesome stuff. Um, how did you, um, how did you come across LinkedIn that early? Like what, how did, yeah. How did you end up here? Uh, so a after I did the stuff at MIT, I went back and um, uh, did some neural network grad work um, at, at MIT. Uh, and then I was at AOL. Um, I wanted to move into consumer internet. So once I saw, it was actually like a year after I left Prophylogic that they got acquired. And so I think I kind of got bit by the uh, startup bug um, mm -hmm. when I saw, you know, hey, there is a... a a light at the end of the tunnel, these things can work. Um, and so I was eager to get into consumer internet. Um, so I was at AOL search, um, in the DC area, they're, they're based in, um, Herndon, Virginia, or they were based there. Um, and so my goal was to just move out to the Bay area. Um, and LinkedIn, actually, when I left AOL, that was the first time I signed up for LinkedIn. Uh, because when you would back then, at least when you would leave, a company, you would get all these LinkedIn invites from your coworkers. Um, and I hadn't created an account yet. So this was back, this must've been like 2008. Uh, I got a LinkedIn invite, signed up. Um, and I actually, I liked the product. There was a group, you know, groups was a bigger feature back then. So I, I, I was on a lot of the early like Hadoop groups and machine learning groups on, on LinkedIn, connected with a lot of people. And so I think that's how we actually met was maybe via Mike Driscoll had like a big data community back then. Um, it was blogging, um, and, uh, he went on to found meta markets, but yeah, so LinkedIn, basically I came out to the Bay area and, you know, like a lot of people, you know, was interviewing, talking to a bunch of different startups. Um, LinkedIn was interesting to me because, um, I, I think a big reason was Re Reed Hoffman, the founder, uh, is really big on networks. Right. Um, and I was a big believer, um, in the power of networks and uh, connecting, you know, to people, to communities. This was before Twitter. Um, uh, I think Twitter w was out, but Twitter was still pretty early. Um, so there was LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Um, I, I was a big believer in uh, the mission of LinkedIn specifically because uh, it's re unfortunately relevant again now. Uh, there, I think there's nothing more meaningful you can do than than get get, get someone a job, right? Um, and people working on things that uh, is important uh, to them and fulfilling and that ma that feels like it matters, I think is really important. Um, and so it seemed like a great opportunity to leverage data. Like they, they had amassed, amassed this large data set of all these people, their profiles, their connections, but they hadn't really flipped that switch yet, that like machine learning or data science switch to leverage it um, to have impact. Um, and that was just beginning when I got there. And so what were the early projects? Like what, what were you doing there? Yeah. Um, so it was interesting. A lot of the core, um, elements that you see today were there at that point. Um, so there was a profile you could connect to people. Um, there was an early version of people you may know. So Jonathan Goldman was the first data scientist to build that. Um, but back then it was running on SQL. Uh, so it was like a big SQL wow. query that would take, I, I don't know, like a few days to run, um, or a series of SQL queries. Um, and the network was much smaller. So I think there were only maybe like 10 million members or something at that point. Um, now there's probably like over 500 million. Um, I don't know the latest number, um, on LinkedIn. Um, but at that point, the data was small enough that you could sort of make that work. But I think it would take 
I think it would actually take over a week to run uh, people you may know at that point. Um, and so some of the first products um, I worked on, uh, the, the first one, actually DJ Patel, who was running the team at the time, um, I was lucky enough based on some of the stuff I'd done before, he gave me a bit of latitude. Um, and he said, you know, just come up with a new product, come up with something um, that you think we should do. Um, and we'll pitch it, um, uh, to, to the board. Uh, and so what I came up with was LinkedIn skills. Uh, so at this time I was still basically an IC data, data scientist, uh, uh, product manager uh, type person. Um, so I pitched this idea of, hey, you know, like skills seems like an obvious thing you should have uh, as an element of somebody's profile. And there's all these other cool things we could do with it. We could use it in search and ad targeting, uh, but we could also use, like you could endorse each other for skills, things like that. Um, so we had these early notions that we could do stuff like that. Um, but the first task is how do you bootstrap something like that? Um, so I'd say the first year was basically bootstrapping and building that from scratch. Um, and so we put, put a team together, Jay Kreps, who's the, uh, co-founder of, uh, Confluent. He was my first engineering partner, uh, on that project. Um, and then Sam Shaw, who rewrote from SQL to MapReduce the, uh, that people you may know was then my, my second engineering partner and he became my co-founder later at a startup, um, uh, skip flag that we did. Um, but that was the first big project. It was actually a pretty, how did you bootstrap it? Yeah. So actually crowdsourcing came in. Um, I think we may have used Crowdflower. We definitely used mechanical Turk. Um, basically it was, it was, it was a mix of different things. So we have in, maybe in the show notes, I can, uh, I give you some references for papers on how we did it. Um, yeah, please. The, 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 the core prototype I actually built in. I think a few weeks. Um, and I really just slapped it together with duct tape. Um, again, some Python, you know, SciPy, uh, I think, yeah, scikit-learn existed, but it was still pretty nascent at the time. Um, and, uh, MapReduce, right. So LinkedIn, the stack back then looked like Hadoop, Pig, um, uh, some Hive, but we mostly settled on Pig, um, uh, you know, which came out of Yahoo. Uh, and it was basically a bunch of batch jobs and the, the idea, the trick, which I had kind of picked up when I was at AOL, I, at AOL, I was working on mining patterns from search query data, um, and then crawling external websites and trying to actually understand the topics in those sites. So you can imagine like if you're on TripAdvisor, what are the topics on TripAdvisor? What are people writing about in reviews? What, you know? Um, what, what, what are the locations that are in search queries? So I'd spent a lot of time working on NLP and information extraction. And so that was basically the idea uh, to bootstrap skills. We've, we had about 10 or 12 million English language profiles. And basically, uh, it was a bit like word to vec, um, but pre word to vec, um, extracting commonly co-occurring phrases uh, from those profiles and then getting a bunch of candidates for named entities, essentially from the raw text and from those candidates for named entities. Um, again, similar to how a lot of people do named entities. Now they use Wikipedia or, uh, D, you know, um, uh, wiki data or things like that, um, as a source of truth. Um, if we could map, uh, those phrases, those surface forms, to an entity in Wikipedia, then I could de I could normalize those. So if you say ROR or Ruby on Rails or Rails, we can disambiguate or we could disambiguate those at LinkedIn down to be you know the same entity. Um, and so it was a really primitive and in, in some sense form of of things that we went on to do at our startup Skip Flag. Um, but wait, wait. So you yeah. you just you used Wikipedia to to pull in the skills. No, so we would use that as a, I, I guess I would say as kind of a, a, a means of normalizing the things that people would say on their profile. So you could, you could do named and it's basically named entity disambiguation. So if somebody says a phrase, uh -huh. um, like let's say angel, right? Yeah. So if you say angel, do you mean you're an angel investor or you, there are people on LinkedIn who do psychic healing and can say they can talk to angels. Uh -huh. And and so you want to be able to disambiguate those two uh, roles. <laughs> but so you use you use Wikipedia for your like ontology. 
the like ontology. So, yeah. So basically the knowledge graph, like it was complicated. So that not everything is in Wikipedia. It's to the notability criterion for creating a Wikipedia entity is pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of jargon, a lot of domain specific stuff is not in Wikipedia. So we mm -hmm. would only use that as a, as a, like you could, let, let's say you, uh, weights and biases, people mm -hmm. start putting that on their LinkedIn profile. That's mm -hmm. an emerging topic, which can be in the knowledge graph. Mm -hmm. But if we can link it to Wikipedia, that gives us a lot more um, evidence and data uh, for tagging, right? Because so really you what like, you want to do, yeah. Would you like manually review new skills then? Like how would you know, say like weights and biases becomes like a skill people want to put. Yeah. How would that, how so would you even create a new one? Yeah, so initially um, it was a combination. So we would have an automated skill discovery you know, job that would detect emerging topics that probably were skills. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had, like this is where production machine learning gets really complicated. If it's user facing, I think I was maybe overly paranoid, but we really ended up not having a lot of issues with things like profanity and um, other, other things like that, offensive topics. Um, and part of the reason was we had many layers of, of, of vetting. And so some of that was human uh, create curated, meaning we had humans come up with, um, you know, white lists and black lists and, and gray lists. So it might be okay for you to put on your profile, for example, alcoholism. If you are a psychiatrist, you helps deal with alcoholism and alcohol, uh, you know, drinking disorders and things like that. But mm -hmm. you wouldn't want the machine learning algorithm to automatically suggest that to someone and be incorrect. And it could be, oh, I see. you know, so that was, that's an example of like a gray list. That's a gray list. So we I had see. multiple tiers of wh where is it appropriate to use, you know, uh -huh. this data. So we may, we may be correct that that person in their profile said alcoholism, but we uh -huh. shouldn't, you know, maybe suggest it as a skill necessarily. Right, right, right. Uh, but where, where does, uh, I think the other thing that is interesting there is the use of crowdsourcing. Uh -huh. So as a way in that first, you know, month when I was bootstrapping the system, um, I was able to get labeled data. Are these the same? Are these phrase that I think the Wikipedia task was something like we would show phrases in context and mm -hmm. then ask them to label, you know, hey, pick which Wikipedia entity is this uh, mm -hmm. phrase? Is this the correct one? And then that powers the machine learning training, which does it automatically. Got it. Cool. And so you worked on that for like a, a year. Like how long did it take you to get something that you could like deploy into production so i think the the prototype end to end with the, you know kind of the front end and you know the using you know sci sci um and uh hadoop etc uh that took you know maybe like two to three months to get something reasonable uh -huh. um and then there was a bunch of design work um and a bunch of engineering work so the engineering Taking something that runs, you know, on your desktop or your laptop um, uh, to do a prototype app that recommends skills uh, for people, uh, you know, that's one thing. But at the time, the way that uh, our production stack worked, we had something called Voldemort, which was a NoSQL data store. And we had Hadoop jobs that would then push uh, metadata, essentially. So let's say you extract suggested skills for all of those, you know, 10 million members, uh, you would compute those suggested skills, push them up to a NoSQL store, and then a recommender service, which sends data to the front end, uh, would have to pull from that data store and display it to the user. And then there's all the logic around, did someone accept the recommendation? Did they decline it? Tracking, which would then go to Kafka eventually. Um, all, all that machinery and all that engineering, that's where, uh, folks like Jay, Jay and Sam Shaw, um, uh, came in and designing that. Um, and then, we, yeah, eventually we, the, the other hard part I would say is like, you always have these choices of, do we do the thing to get it done quickly? Or do we do the thing to set us up so we can do 10 more products like this? Mm -hmm. Um, and in those early days, we we were at this transition point. We actually, we had, they had done in the past, a lot of things, like I mentioned the, you know, the three day SQL query. Um, we wanted to do things in a bit more scalable way. So we bit the bullet and, um, you know, a lot of things like Kafka and other, other projects came out of those efforts to make it more scalable. 
Cool. But so how so it was like two to three months to make the prototype, and then how long did it take you to get it out? I mean, I think it took it took about a year to get. It was phased, right? So we did. This is another good point, which is like um, people should look for opportunities to do an MVP. Um, and so the way that we approached it was we actually did email first. So it was much easier, like changing the front end of LinkedIn at that time was kind of a, a big, heavy process. And we, we had this framework, which is pretty hard to work with. Uh, it would take an intern like a month to learn how to, you know, commit a change and push it to the site. Um, and so email is much easier. So if we could push the data out of Hadoop to mm -hmm. an email job, um, uh, you can imagine something like an email campaign on MailChimp. Well, we weren't using MailChimp, but something like that. Sure. Um, and you could push the recommendation. So I could send an email to you saying, hey, Lucas, do you have these skills? Add them to your profile. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it's a much lighter weight way uh, to do that. So that, I think, took another few months to get all the pieces uh, powered, the back end, so mm -hmm. that we could do that. Um, and then the work to get the front end done uh, and, uh, you know, actually roll it out in a B test was probably another few months. So, um, but, all, all in, you know, it probably took about six or seven months at that point in time to get this on, you know, out for all users on LinkedIn. Must've been satisfying when it was deployed though. It like touches so many people. Yeah. I think it was actually the first strata. So I remember DJ, uh, Patel had a, a keynote, um, and he was going to announce it but it wasn't, it like wasn't quite ready to ship. Um, and so I think it was, I had a talk a couple of days later. Um, and yeah, I think we announced it sometime right around then, right around the first strata in like 2010. Yeah. Cool. Hi, we'd love to take a moment to tell you guys about weights and biases. Weights and biases is a tool that helps you track and visualize every detail of your machine learning models. We help you debug your machine learning models in real time collaborate easily, and advance the state of the art in machine learning. You can integrate weights and biases into your models with just a few lines of code. With hyperparameter sweeps, you can find the best set of hyperparameters for your models automatically. You can also track and compare how many GPU resources your models are using. With one line of code, you can visualize model predictions in form of images, videos, audio, plotly charts, molecular data, segmentation maps, and 3D point clouds. You can save everything you need to reproduce your models days, weeks, or even months after training. Finally, with reports, you can make your models come alive. Reports are like blog posts in which your readers can interact with your model metrics and predictions. Reports serve as a centralized repository of metrics, predictions, hyperparameter stride, and accompanying nodes. All of this together gives you a bird's eye view of your machine learning workflow. You can use reports to share your model insights, keep your team on the same page, and collaborate effectively remotely. I'll leave a link in the show notes below to help you get started. And now, let's get back to the episode. You know, you went on to start um, to start Skip Flag. I guess what was it like going from like a bigger company into like your own um, startup? Like, how how was that experience for you? It was interesting. So, I I think the part that I left out in that transition was um, moving into management, right? So, mm, yeah. um, I had I had managed projects and small teams before, but as LinkedIn grew, when I when I joined LinkedIn, there were about three hundred employees. Uh, when I left, there was over I think six thousand. Um, and our data team, I think, you know, obviously the Facebook data team and LinkedIn, there were a number of data teams at that time that grew pretty fairly large. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, like everybody else in a hyper growth company, we, you know, we had to learn a lot about how to run data teams. Right. Mm. Um, and one of the challenges, uh, that I found was, uh, that the the tools we were using, as enterprise tools essentially, and, and workplace software was still mm -hmm. really dumb, right? So you're building all these cool, smart systems for you know Facebook and Google on the front end um, and LinkedIn, uh, but the tools that all of us were using at tech companies were still pretty stupid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what I really wanted to do was you know apply some of that technology um, you know to those workplace problems and more specifically like intelligent assistants. 
Um, so, so get it moving to a startup. What was it like? Um, I, I think that it, it's not as obvious when you're, uh, in these larger companies where you've, you've hit scale, everybody specializes and you have, you know, there was a great joke actually on Twitter last night. Um, I forget who said this, but, um, uh, it might've been uh Pardis, you know, Pardis, right. Uh, uh, she was at Twitter in the past, I think. Um, any, anyway, so she said, uh, who, who came up with data engineer, it should have been data Lakers. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, <laughs> but like those data Lakers or data engineers, um, who are doing all that hard work and like, you know, creating those no SQL stores, creating the infrastructure. I think a lot of folks who go off to do a startup, uh, then the reality hits them that, you know, wow, there's actually a lot to build. And even mm-hmm. this was like 2015. So even with Amazon web services or Google or Azure or whatever, there's still a lot of pieces, um, and a lot of glue that you rely on in companies like Google and Facebook that is just not there and you have to kind of put together yourself. Um, mm, so that yeah. was a bit, that was a big journey was building a lot of that. Um, but I would say overall, uh, it was, it was extremely fun. Um, when you're at a big company, uh, you end up spending a lot of time. There's a lot of impact that you can have, but at the same time, you spend a huge amount of time on coordination, right? And Mm -hmm. red tape and getting everyone on the same page. Um, And one of the advantages of startup, obviously, is you can move a lot faster. Um, You you make mistakes, but they're your mistakes. Uh, And, you know, that that was really exciting. How did you, I've never asked you this. I'm actually genuinely curious about this one. I don't know. So how did you, like you had kind of an enterprise tool that helped you sort of like organize information at skip flag, like, how did you, um, I've never had this problem as an entrepreneur just because the, the spaces I've gone into, but like, how did you prototype it? Like, did you get someone to give you their like Slack logs and like do it for them? Or like, how do you even like build yeah. an ML algorithm without the data? Yeah. So that's the chicken and egg problem. Um, so I'm a little OCD when it comes to data and data sets. So, uh, for, back maybe like 2007 or 2008, I wrote a blog post, some data sets available on the web. And mm-hmm. it was in this early days. So Aaron Schwartz was another person who was really big on making data sets available and open. And he famously got in trouble for scraping, um, you know, academic journals. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so he was working on some projects in this area. I had been collecting a lot of data sets, a lot of public data sets for years. Mm. Um, and using the Twitter API, for example, I had, you know, been doing firehose crawls for years, Wikipedia. I'm an, I was, uh, I'm an advisor to common crawl, right? Uh-huh. So that was used cool. to create glove and a lot of these other NLP data sets, uh-huh. um, that we all, you know, enjoy today. Um, is the Enron corpus still relevant? Is that still around? I remember working on that. It's funnily enough, it really is. We, we did some work. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't want to get, uh, you know, give away too much, uh, secret sauce or details, but we were working with one enterprise customer. Um, so initially I, uh, I can, let me say a little bit more about the tool and then I'll, I'll talk about the end. Right, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the, how did we get going? So what are, what skip flag was, was doing, we were a knowledge base that would build itself out of your enterprise, uh, communication. And Mm -hmm. so we started actually with Slack um, because um, one of our uh, our first investors was Excel. Um, And so I actually did an EIR at Excel um, and was hanging out there at the time as we put the company together. And they were investors in Slack. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so I was using Slack a a little bit before it launched. Uh, So I think that was maybe like 2014, 2015. Um, And I really liked it. I'm I'm pretty picky when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, workplace tools. Um, and I, you know, I enjoyed it. Obviously they've been massively successful. Um, every, you know, tons of people use Slack. Um, but it felt like an opportunity for a data set, right? So Mm -hmm. nobody was really using that data set yet. It posed some unique challenges similar to Twitter, um, Mm -hmm. in that, you know, email, there'd been email startups, uh, many email startups before, Um, and their startups working on documents, but Slack was interesting because to me, it felt closer to Twitter, short form messaging data, very hard to do the kinds of things that we were working on of knowledge extraction and any, uh, disambiguation. Um, but there's a lot of the data, a lot of data and it's accessible. So they had a pretty 
a good API in the early days um, in terms of actually pulling public channel Slack data. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the initial way we bootstrapped was actually using Slack. Um, and one of the hard parts is if you were to build the whole product, I think we still have a video online from, um, we did a paper in KDD and they, you know, have you do, um, a short video describing the paper. Uh, mm -hmm. so we did a paper on entity extraction on, on, sh uh, noisy text. Um, and in the video, we have a short product demo. So people will put that in the show notes, I guess, uh, people can check that out. Um, but before we got to that full blown product, which looked a bit like if you use notion or other, you know, modern wiki like products, it looked a bit like that, except it had this AI infused that could auto organize all your docs and answer questions. You could upload eventually, ultimately after required by workday. One of the things we worked on was you could give it like a PDF of your work workplace HR policies. And it could do fact extraction across all that and then automatically answer questions, which is pretty cool for, you know, an HR person to have this thing automatically answer those questions based on just a, a document. Um, but before you get to that, how, how do you how do you do this with little data? So basically, like we I went around to my friends, you know, I got like 100 uh, or so startups that I knew, uh, got them in as beta users and said, hey, um, Slack is confusing. It's noisy. It's hard to sift through. What if we, um, gave you a smart email digest and we just summarized what's going on in your Slack team so that you can, mm -hmm. you know, keep up to date with what's happening and see interesting stuff. Um, and, oh, it'll have like news articles recommended based on, you know, what you're talking about and things like that. So we did that. We did that prototype. Um, and to do that, you know, we had, other auxiliary data sets and we could do a bit of transfer learning and things like that. So we had the Wikipedia corpus, common crawl, which is, you know, a fairly large data set for NLP. Um, I think it's a, a few terabytes of web, web crawl data. Um, so we were able to train and bootstrap on open data sets and web crawl data and Twitter data in combination then with customer uh, data um, uh, to train and do something like smart summarization and entity extraction cool but yeah and that was it say, you, you're gonna mention the enron corpus did you did you also use that oh enron? yeah yeah i left the enron so that came, actually came much later so we started with slack we did the email digest and then in parallel we were building out the product with that became skip flag mm -hmm. um and one of the things that we found was that slack is great but lar at the time so this is like 2016 2017 Larger companies were still not all in on Slack, and I, I think they probably st still are not all in on Slack. Uh, Teams is getting a lot of adoption, obviously, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but people, the world still runs on email, right? So email is is a big deal. Um, and we had worked with email before. My, my co-founder, Sam Shaw, actually ran email relevance at LinkedIn. Um, and so we, we're pretty familiar with working with email and the Enron Corpus. I actually took a class. Leslie Cabling, I think, bought... Back at MIT, she bought the corpus from, uh, I don't know, she bought it from Enron or they were bankrupt or whatever, right? So she bought uh -huh. the data set and that's how it became an open data set. She curated it and put it out there. Oh, wow. um, anyway, long story longer, someone like as we got into uh, email, that's one of the few e public email data sets out there. So when we would want to um, show a customer right? How well this could work. That would, mm -hmm. that was the data set that we would benchmark on. And a lot of academic papers still use that right as a benchmark. Um, I, it's funny, I remember working on it in grad school and just feeling kind of sorry for all the employees that, uh, like got all the emails like released, but it's, I think it was a good lesson for me. Cause now I'm really religious about like keeping work stuff in work email and personal stuff in personal email. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's good advice. So you don't realize that there's nobody more careful than a data scientist or machine learning <laughs> engineer for sure. <laughs> um, no, and I, I was totally the same way. So I think we were very, um, you know, so that was one of the things. Sometimes we would work with a customer um, and it's their own data, right? So you're processing the data. Um, and a lot, like sometimes it would happen where we would turn on, you know, say that email digest or that product and people would say, okay, I changed my mind. Let's turn this off. And because they didn't realize you know, you know, maybe it's like customer credit card numbers, things like that. There's all these things in the data that they didn't realize are in there. So if you have a customer support channel in Slack or something like that, um, 
the hygiene, I guess the data hygiene is really important, especially if you're an enterprise company. Um, and this was right before, this is like before GDPR. So after we were acquired, that, that year after we were acquired was when GDPR hit. Um, but we were really careful from the beginning and really rigorous. We had PII scrubbing and all kinds of stuff in our machine learning pipeline from day one. Um, just Wait, because how, you we did were automatic PII scrubbing? How, how would you even yeah. know that it's PII? So there's a bunch of techniques out there. Um, so it's obviously nothing is foolproof, but I, I, this actually goes back to that first week at AOL. Um, I had just started, so I was I was almost in quarantine, right? So I hadn't been involved with the release of the search data set. Um, so for whatever reason, I was tasked with going in and putting in place a bunch of the PII protection. So you can imagine in search query logs, right? What what are common things that Wait, would be you sensitive? put in place the PII stuff for the AOL? Query I didn't put log it in. Release? I didn't put it fully in place. I wasn't. So I I was a data scientist. I wasn't in uh, really uh, uh, doing the production engineering, but I did put together you know the the scrubbing layer, um, which was things like okay, how do you detect you know FedEx IDs? How do you detect SS social security numbers? All that kind of stuff. And I so see. this is years ago. If you were going to do yeah. it now, Microsoft actually has an open source project um, uh, for this. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other there, oh, there's cool. a, there's a, about a half dozen um, open source efforts to do this kind of thing now. Oh, cool. But I yeah, you, ha you, have tell to, people, you have to try. What's the AOL uh, query story? The query story. Um, sure, well, briefly. so I think I, I, I mean, you should really have Abdur on. I don't know if it, <laughs> we you, should really get to talk about it. But, um, so, so yeah, Ab Abdur was a chief scientist at, uh, at Twitter and previously he was driving uh, search at, at AOL. Um, I mean, it, it was a strange situation because, um, I mean, technically uh, nothing was out of the norm in that. So you mentioned the Enron data set, right? So mm -hmm. at the time in academic research, the... In, in the world of search, there were a few data sets. There was an Excite, Excite Logs, uh, MSN um, had, a, had a data set out there of search query logs. And so there was kind of an accepted format. There were, there were like two or three, maybe Lycos had a data set out there. There were two or three data sets in the academic world that were search query logs. And so AOL basically released one in the same format. So I think mm -hmm. that they didn't really expect um, an, anything like this to happen. But what ended up happening was um, uh, Reddit. You, this is in the early days of Reddit too, right? So I remember um, uh, I was actually looking at Reddit on the weekend when I had just started this job, and I saw on the you know on the new page where emerging stories are popping up, I saw the story AOL releases search logs, uh, and, and some user I don't know if they were the first person to see it on Reddit or if it was a reporter, um, but uh, someone on Reddit like said, "Hey, check this out." their search queries here. And then what happened was a whole bunch of people started putting up sites where they put a web app in front of the search query logs and you could go in and like explore like crazy queries. Um, and it was, you know, query, query session logs are deeply private and sensitive things. So even if you remove the user ID, this is what the world discovered basically when that happened. Hey, it was a wake up call. Um, I think a lot of people in technology already knew that obviously this stuff could be sensitive. Um, but I think for a lot of the world, it was a wake up call that, you know, what I type in to my browser goes somewhere and it ha it can have an impact. Um, and so if you think about the advice back in the early 2000s dealing with Google, the general advice out there was always Google your name. Like every few weeks, you should Google your name to make sure that there isn't something bad on the Internet about you or, you know, whatever, like reputation management. But actually, what that means then is in those anonymized search query logs, usually the, one of the more common things that people were Googling was actually their name, right? So then that made it fairly easy to triangulate, in many cases, um, individuals. And so that's what ended up happening was, um, so the, ultimately, the search data set was taken down. Um, and then I think it, we entered into this period where it was much more difficult for academia, like you mentioned, the Enron data set. I don't think something like that would happen today. Um, you wouldn't have an Enron data set. You wouldn't have the AOL search logs. Um, and and so it became much more locked down. I think the Netflix prize data set was one of the last big ones. Um, yeah, and I remember those complaints, right? Like they, I think Netflix didn't actually do a follow-up to their competition, right? Because there was privacy 
uh, concerns yep. people brought up. So yeah, I mean, it did. It, it was a good run, right? And then that was kind of correlated with the birth of rebirth of deep learning. Um, cause I remember I was actually working on that on the side, um, when it was going on. So I, th I think I was at AOL at the time and, um, I was working on the Netflix prize, uh, and I was in all the forums and it was like, this was before Kaggle, but it was basically one of the first, you know, there were the data mining competitions and then there was a the Netflix prize and then there was Kaggle. Um, and it was really interesting. Uh, to see the progress because uh, deep learning kind of came out of left field and ended up working really well. And then ens ensemble techniques. Um, but I think that that really, that period was kind of the catalyst for a lot of what, you know, day to day folks like you and I deal with um, in machine learning and like this kind of massive surge of progress, I think is largely because these of these benchmarks um, and then things like ImageNet. Um, so anyway, I, I know we're on a tangent here, but, uh, I, I think that, um, I don't know. I just think that that was a really exciting period. Um, and we're seeing like the compounding effect of that now, um, where, you know, the technologies that people have at their disposal are amazing compared to what we had 10 years ago. Totally. Uh, and it's so powerful. Tell me about, um, I really want to make sure I get this in before we run yeah. out of time. Like you're now, or you've been lately doing some, um, consulting for different companies and like, what are you like, what are you seeing out there? Like what are, um, I'm really curious, like what kinds of stuff are people doing and, and what kind of technology are they using at this point? Like is, is Python and C++ still the, the standard? Like what's, what's going on? I, I haven't seen C++ in a while actually. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe some people, uh, yeah, if you're using devices and things maybe, but, um, you know, it's interesting. So yeah, I, 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 after the acquisition of the startup, um, I, uh, started, uh, I, I took a break, started doing some angel investing and I, I get, um, you know, people ping me periodically, you know, to come in and help with strategy and help with consulting and kind of running, you know, data orgs or rebooting data, data orgs sometimes. Um, and so it's interesting, uh, deep learning, you know, go back like three, four years ago, uh, it was seen as a risky, uh, proposition, you know, uh, unless you're a small startup, right? So bigger companies, uh, were not, I think doing it as much, um, you know, in like 2014, 2015. Um, but, uh, now it does seem like everybody, you know, Everybody wants to be using TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, uh, things like that. Uh, I think that also, obviously, the cloud providers have become, you know, a big player. Uh, so a lot of people are using, you know, SageMaker. Uh, they might be using, you know, the Google Cloud Platform. Um, but do you, have you know, stuff, a lot hey, of people do you, do you have stuff you recommend? Like when you come in, do you do you have like an opinion on like what people should be using? I, I'd say I am still somewhat agnostic. So I, I generally, I, I tend to use Amazon myself, um, but I, I'm not, I'm, op I'm open to using other tools and other platforms. Um, and so for example, I've got a camera here. Pull this, out. this is pretty cool. So I've got this Azure smart uh, camera. Uh, I'll plug that. Um, so I'm going to play around with that. Um, but that's the cool thing is like, I mean, if you're using TensorFlow, you know, all, all the big players use all the same open source stuff, right? So I can run TensorFlow on Microsoft or Google or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, it really depends on the problem and it depends on, on your company stack, right? I'd, I'd say if you're already all in on Google, um, then using a lot of the Google tooling can make sense. Um, sure. and so that's where I think like, you know, I, I'm not religious about one, one platform or another. I think they're all converging to some degree. Um, but my, I, I have a lot more experience with the Amazon stack, probably like most people. Um, but, uh, yeah. So in terms of like what I see at these companies, uh, I think that what ends up happening, it's, it's actually similar to how things were a decade ago, I guess, in that data science, when we changed the branding, right. To, from research scientist or machine learning scientist to data science, um, a lot of that was because you needed people who could put stuff into production. Mm -hmm. um, and that production machine learning engineering and data engineering was different than an academic who can write a paper. Um, and so I think that you do have 
um, this challenge uh, when it comes to hiring and shipping products. Um, it's managing research scientists is something that's difficult for anybody, uh, but it's difficult if that's not your area of expertise. So if you're an enterprise company, uh, if you're you know building workplace software, or even if you're a consumer company, right? Um, t- typically, they'll they'll have like you know a VP of Eng or something try to manage those teams. But if mm-hmm. they don't have background, it can be really hard because planning is hard, right? Um, prioritizing those projects, knowing what's likely to work. Um, if somebody hasn't done it before, and then you hire some people like out of school or people who've worked on Kaggle competitions. There's a lot of pieces that they're missing to actually ship and execute. Do you think there's something different about data stuff than other things? Because like if I'm a VP of engineering, I can't be an expert on, you mm-hmm. know, like DevOps and um, you know architecture and all these things. So I have to kind of rely on on folks. Like, is there something that makes data science like particularly challenging in, in this way? I think part of it. Um, so look, in all these other areas, the tools and technologies definitely change, and people have to keep up with them. I think one of the challenges um, with machine learning is partly because of the people who work on it and partly just because of the nature of the field and how rapidly it's changing. Um, They're always trying the latest thing, right? Um, And I think that's very hard to manage, whether it's even just something as simple as like library dependencies or, um, you know, uh, uh, methodology. Uh, Things are are changing rapidly. and that is at the root of it. I think the other thing is no, if you're doing DevOps, DevOps at company A actually probably looks a lot like DevOps at company B, right? You, you, you choose your stack, you choose your tooling, and you know, then you live with the consequence, consequences of those decisions. Um, but for machine learning, almost every problem is different, right? Uh, so it's kind of like that saying, what is it? like? Um, Every, every family is dysfunctional in its own unique way, right? So I think the same thing is true of machine learning teams and projects. Um, you know, if you're trying to predict financial fraud um, and before you are working on, you know, detecting, um, uh, you know, porn and user profile images, those are two vastly different problems. So SREs may look like SREs across companies, but machine learning problems are not all identical. Interesting. Let's talk about this article you wrote, um, what you need to know about product management for AI. Um, you know, I guess the it seems like the best place to start with this um, is a question I have about a lot of um, things written about AI, which is kind of like, what makes product management for AI different than, than product management in general? So I think the main difference between product management for AI and product management for traditional software projects is that machine learning software is inherently probabilistic, whereas classic software development is more deterministic. Ideally with software, you have this you know, rich uh, methodology around unit tasks and functional tasks, integration tasks and builds, and you're uh, you know, working on developing the software and you expect it to always behave the same way if you've uh, instrumented the right tests and 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 that creates a very clear comfortable development process and both engineering leaders and architects and uh, product managers are comfortable with that right so most product managers like to uh, run projects that are predictable right so they like to be able to commit to deadlines to work with partner teams and customers and be able to commit to a date um, and if you are mostly building things that are clear uh, and that are understandable or that like things that you built before, you can come up with good estimates if you have enough experience. I think with machine learning, the the uncertainty comes from a bunch of places, uh, but it's all the way down to the individual algorithm. So if you're training a model, right, um, there's some amount of randomization, different random weights can lead to different results, um, all the way to uh, you know, your approach, your approach may be different. Um, every, every problem is a little bit different for machine learning, right? Otherwise it would be essentially solved. So you, there's always something different about it. Maybe it's a slightly different application, a uh, different data set that you're using. That's let's say a movie recommender, 
Um, if you're going to recommend or, or video recommendation, if you're going to recommend videos on TikTok, that's on the surface seems similar to recommending Netflix movies, but if you peel back the onion, it's really pretty different, right? So they're short videos. There's not a lot of context. They're very fresh, very new every day. Um, and they're user generated, right? So you don't know what is going to be in that video. Um, and there's not a lot like dialogue, right? There's just something interesting. It's more visual versus Netflix has a curated catalog of blockbuster movies or self-produced movies where everything is very carefully controlled. Um, so on the surface, those both look like recommender problems, but for a machine learning person, they would realize, okay, there's a huge set of different things I would have to do for TikTok than I would have to do for Netflix. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just scratching the surface, but why are these different? Really, um, the planning process is, is often very different because it's very data dependent and very application dependent um, versus, um, you know, a... A user sign-up flow looks very similar across many different software applications. So, what does the like planning process even look like in in the face of this amount of uncertainty? Yeah, so I think there there's two things. There's what maybe the planning process should look like, and then realistically, what it looks like uh, in most companies. <laughs> sure. So, I'd say in most companies, the pattern I've seen is people just do what they know. They continue to try to plan um, these uh, traditional software products. Uh, I think the better teams are aware of some of these issues um, and, and they treat the uncertainty from day one and they build it into um, their planning. Um, so it's, it's effectively, most machine learning projects are much closer to R and D um, than they are, um, you know, something very clear and, and, and easy to execute on. Um, so I think that the best ways I've seen to plan involves first starting with what are the core problems that matter to your business, right? So one of the problems uh, could just be the set of machine learning projects you're working on may not be the right ones. Um, so typically companies have some kind of product planning process, roadmap building. Um, they may do this quarterly, they may do this annually, uh, where they come up with a set of funded projects and that they're going to staff, that they're going to resource, and they're, and they're going to uh, execute on. Um, and so I think fundamentally, uh, you need to have a clear set of projects that align with your company strategy. So let's say, you know, you're a consumer app and, uh, growth is important, right? So one of your key metrics may be daily active users, uh, and, you know, time on site and, um, signups, things like that. So clear business metrics where if you're, uh, machine learning project has an impact, you can see uh, the number change, right? So you, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to spend, you know, six months to a year working on a machine learning project. And then at the end of it, you can't see a material impact in any numbers, right? Um, and this does happen a lot. So a lot of people, I'd say, especially in enterprise, machine learning is seen often more as a feature, like an interesting checkbox to have but it's not necessarily tied to a clear business uh, outcome. Why do you think that happens? I mean, a lot of folks have talked about it that, that we've talked to, um, but it sort of seems like connecting a project to a business outcome is something, you know, that, that's a best practice for, for any kind of project, right? Like what, I, I do hear this over and over, so yeah. there must be something going on, but what, what do you think it is? I think some of it is just lack of familiarity with the domain. Um, so, in some ways, unfortunately, it's like blockchain, right? So people hear a buzzword, they hear blockchain, and they say, okay, we need to have a blockchain story. So I think when these things start top down, sometimes that happens. So the company may say, okay, our board is pushing us uh, to, you know, have blockchain strategy. And then they get some consultants in maybe, or, you know, they have internal execs uh, come up with something. And then I think when these things tend to be pushed top down, sometimes it can be good to have executive support. Don't get me wrong, but I think you do need the bottom up expertise um, and experience uh, to connect those dots. And that's really where product management like shines. Um, so I think if you have a good product manager who's thinking, uh, who's very numbers driven, that, that can help. And I do think that tends to happen more in these instrumented companies versus um, enterprises, usually more sales driven. What about um, like specifically addressing the uncertainty? Like, you know, say, you know, 
say you have a thing that's connected to like a business outcome. Um, but, you know, like you said earlier, you know, with ML, it's often hard to even know like how good of a system you can build. So yep. like, how do you plan around um, that level of uncertainty? Yeah. So there, there are a number of different strategies. One of, one of the ones that I'm really um, honing in on lately is it's an old strategy. Uh, it's what DARPA used for self-driving cars. It's what, um, you know, uh, Netflix used for the Netflix prize and, uh, you know, all the data mining competitions used for years, which is benchmarks. So I think if you, uh, you know, if you have a clear, you could go back to video recommendation again, Netflix said, you know, created a data set, a benchmark data set and released, um, you know, held back some test data set and released, um, you know, training data uh, for people to train models and then had a clear set of evaluation metrics. And they said, here's, you know, current state of the art or what, it, what is in production right now. And we're going to pay a million dollars uh, for the first team to get a 10% improvement. I think it was 10%. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, 10%, um, yeah. And so that makes it the nice thing. And this will appeal to, I think, a lot of product managers. Uh, they like clear objectives and goals um, that people can rally around, that your team can rally around. So um, I found that really effective. I found two things. If you can't construct that benchmark, and, and I'm, it's surprising the number of teams that actually skip ahead, they just don't even bother with that, right? They just, um, they may have some business metrics they're measuring, but they, and they may have model metrics that they're using internally, but they're not really connecting um, those in a clear way. And they're not doing it, like for example, it's like testing in production, right? They, they may do something where they have an A-B test and they say, hey, when we rolled out this new model code, we, in our A-B test, we saw you know, a 5% lift. So it's better than the old one, good job, work on the next model. And if you're, if you're doing that, it's very easy to fool yourself and it's very hard to debug, right? So that's where the uncertainty creeps in is, you don't really know where you stand. You don't know, well, was there something else happening in the data during that time period that you know, affected the model? If we reran that same model on new data, would we get the same result? Um, and so that, this is where I think like experiment management is one way you, you could frame this. It's really critical that you build those benchmarks and that you, um, you know, hold out some data set, some, some stream of traffic, for example, and you keep running on multiple models so that you can uh, ensure you haven't regressed in terms of performance. I remember one of the things that um, you know you said to me in a, um, a private conversation was talking about sort of standups with um, you know like ML teams feels a little different than standups with an engineering team because it's kind of yeah. like with the engineering teams like hey I did this feature I did this feature um, but then with an ML team it's a little harder right like do you have any any thoughts around that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I, you know, I've mentioned this on Twitter a few times as well, and it's interesting to see that uh, the discussion that people have around this. So I think a lot of data scientists, it, it resonates um, mm -hmm. in that. Uh, and some of it may just be uh, understanding the nature of the work that scientists and, and machine learning researchers are doing um, and then how to translate that into that kind of stand up format. Um, I think you see the clash of cultures right immediately in a standup because often people have, say you're doing, I don't know, um, you know, agile development or, you, you know, scrum or something where you have like very clear car chunks of work that are, you know, may take one to two days in traditional software development. If, if all the people working on other parts of a product launch have work that's easily chunked in that way, then they can close the JIRA tickets more easily. They say, oh yeah, I implemented, you know, that, you know, API that will talk to, you know, the email system and, you know, we're, we're all set and it's, it's in testing. Um, that's very different from, you know, the data, they get to the data scientists in the standup and they say, well, you know, I'm still, uh, you know, training the model and, you know, something's not working, but I'm not quite sure what it is. I'm going to look into, uh, you know, the initial, initialization parameters and maybe try to optimize that and I'll report back next time and then repeat, right? And it's always something until the, mo the model isn't working until it's working, unfortunately. Um, and so I think that can create some stress. Maybe it's just me, uh, but, I, but I, I feel that stress. Um, and so in terms of strategies to deal with that, um, for product managers, 
I think it, I think it, it, it's at least good to call it out. And so I think if you don't talk about it, it can get, it can start to seem strange. Um, so I think it's at least worth calling out. Um, and this gets to the point of like organizational support for these ML projects. Um, if you listen to chatter, uh, you know, there's all kinds of apps for, you know, back channels now and there's Slack and there's other things um, like blind where people talk about their companies. Um, and especially in an environment where we have like now where there's economic uncertainty and pressure, uh, I think increasingly you're going to have this chatter, which is already there around, Hey, what are those ML people actually doing? Right. They're getting these big paychecks. Like where's the beef? What are, what are they delivering? And so this is where the, I think this is critical, critically important and like standups. I think it'd be good to have, you know, more of a, a clarity around what should machine learning folks report in standups and make it clear that the progress meter is going to be a little different and it may be research results. Like here's the objective we had this week. Um, you know, here are the things that we wanted to put in place and, you know, we accomplished them even if the results are not there. I think if you say, Hey, we're going to improve by 5% this week. And, and that's, that's our goal for the standup that that can be very hard because you may not hit it. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. We had Chris uh, Albin, um, on this show also, and he was talking about a lot about sort of, I forget how to put it, but like kind of creating a sense of like emotional security for his ML team. And I think a big part of that for him was sort of, um, you know, like not focusing people too much on, um, you know, the sort of like external, like 5%, um, increased goals. I, I have to say, you know, he, he made some sense, but I think in, I was a little bit unconvinced for myself. I mean, I feel like as someone you know, like running a company under pressure, I do feel like, um, I feel like for me, yeah, like I think like the way that I run my teams is pretty um, sort of external metrics uh, focused. Yeah. Um, but I think there's downsides to it for sure. And it's 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 very hard to know like what a reasonable goal is. Um, so I, yeah, I go back and forth. I, I think, um, so I think it varies depending on the stage of the project and of the company. Um, so when they're just starting with machine learning, I think the hard reality is it's going to be hard to get to that uh, number when you don't even have your ML infrastructure in place. Mm -hmm. So I think in the early stages, before you actually have a working product in production, unfortunately, it's going to be really hard to be metrics driven. So you may have decoupled, you may have like some set of people working on, you know, sample data, you know, training a model, and maybe quickly you can get to a benchmark. So that would be I, what I would suggest people do is so I, I kind of agree with you and I agree with Chris, but I, I think that you have to encapsulate it in different ways. If you have no part of your team that's numbers driven, um, then you're in trouble. So what I would say is, let's say you're starting a new project. Let's say it's um, uh, fraud detection and accounting or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to roll out that model. It's one of the things when you get back to project management planning and how do you run these projects, as quickly as possible, you you need to get to a benchmark data set, right? So I remember I uh, Leslie Cabling. I think we talked about her before. Um, uh, she was uh, she's a professor at MIT. I took machine a machine learning course she taught years ago, um, and one of the things she said there was a project in the course, and people had to pick projects, right? So in some ways, it's similar to picking a project in your company. And she said one of the most important things is if you don't have the data set in hand now pick a different problem because if you're, you're going to spend the whole semester just gathering the data set. Right. Um, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily give that advice for a company. If you don't have the data set, maybe you do need to gather it. Um, but if you can have that data set, uh, ready to go and get people working on a benchmark right away, and then you can get on this nice track where you can track progress. Um, my teams would even put, we'd have like a whiteboard, um, with a goal, you know, Hey, in two weeks, this is the number we want to hit. And maybe it's like AUC, you know, X, um, and everybody would just keep their eye on that, on that number. And we'd know what we were shooting for. And it would be like a kind of a two week horizon. I think, yeah, I, I, two to three weeks. Um, now that's once you have a working model, right? So once you have a baseline model, so one of the most important things you can do is just start with an MVP um, get something basic in place so that you can get on that 
you know, um, uh, AUC improvement train. Uh, and once you can do that, then you can create this momentum where the team feels like there's progress. Um, and I think for project planning, uh, then it becomes more clear. So once something's shipped, and assuming it is tied to a business metric where you improve AUC and then you see revenue increase or users increase or something, then it becomes very clear what impact your team is having. And so I think this solves that back channel chatter issue as well. If it, part of the PM's job here is to keep people moving towards that objective, but then also to communicate it to the rest of the company. So a good you know, weekly status emails, um, get in the company, you know, update emails that go out to everybody and make it very clear that, hey, we have these model improvements which caused you know, X or Y um, to our bottom line metrics. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So Chris, I don't know what Chris's comments were, but uh, it sounds like shielding your team uh, so they don't feel overly stressed by metrics can make sense. But um, I think that's more important in deep R&D, right? So for example, if um, somebody had, like at Google, they would have 20% projects, right? At LinkedIn, mm -hmm. we did this as well, except it's not as simple as like, okay, one day a week of someone's time. Often what would happen is entire sets of people would be 100% on a 20% project, right? right and right. in ML, that's really what you need to do sometimes. Um, and, and so shield those people, definitely. Well, I remember the... Um Years ago, the Diffbot uh, CEO told me that he basically gave out bonuses uh, to his ML team based on like the lift that they got on you know the projects that they were working on. And um, on one hand, you know, it seems like a very uh, like fair management strategy. Where you're kind of pushing down the decision making, mm -hmm. um, you know, to the, the 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 folks working on it. I guess on the other hand, it it certainly. Um, I've worked on many projects where I've been really surprised, you know, by not being able to make any progress or being able to make yep. way more progress than I wanted. So, you know, I, I think it could be like, a, that could be a more stressful environment for sure. Right. Yeah. I think in the article, I mentioned something related to this. I'm not sure if I mentioned OKRs explicitly, but I do talk about, um, uh, you know, setting goals and setting objectives and then how that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is a great example. I, I am a believer in that general framework. I think what becomes difficult, so for people who aren't familiar with product management via um, uh, OK, measurement via OKRs, um, what typically happens is at the beginning of a quarter, every, everybody signs up for an OKR. Um, and it's supposed to be, uh, you're not supposed to sandbag. You're not supposed to set the bar low. You're supposed to uh, have a reasoned, um, ambitious goal. And so maybe, and you typically have something like three OKRs per quarter. And it might be, you know, increase user signups by, you know, 20%, um, increase, you know, revenue per user by, you know, 10%, something like that. Um, and they may be a little more granular, right? So especially in a larger company, they become more granular and it may be something like increase search relevance uh, as measured by, you know, F1 or whatever by, you know, 30%. Um, and, and so in any case, those metrics I think are important. And I think the hard part is among the product leaders, you, you have to be very careful about how much latitude you give on just pure ML metrics versus business metrics, because it's very easy for teams. That's how you get this like bubble where everybody's just doing R and D. And then I think what ends up happening is a lot of the business leaders and PMs see those OKRs and they just shrug and say, I don't understand how that relates to the business. Right, right, right. But, but OKRs, I would, rewarding people for OKRs is pretty standard. Um, and where that can go wrong, I think the YouTube example is one of the best known ones where um, by all like OKR metrics, YouTube has been succeeding wildly over the last, you know, five or six years probably. But the downside is, when you manage to a single number, it, it doesn't, PMs become machines. They're like the, the parable of AI uh, in paper clips where you build an amazing paper clip optimizer uh, for, uh, with AI and then it uh, you know, destroys the world to make as many paper clips as it can. 
Um, so PMs are the same way where you give them a metric, they're going to hit it, but there may be a lot of collateral damage. In the case of YouTube, there was a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theories because they lead to clicks. So by the me measure of you know, engagement on YouTube, they're doing fantastic. Um, but at what cost? Right, right. I guess that's a good segue to another topic that you talk about in your paper that might be interesting to talk about here, which is sort of building infrastructure to make your um, AI or machine learning actually scale. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I guess, like, what kinds of recommendations do you, do you have there? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a deep, deep topic. Um, so I think there's a spectrum of companies. So companies that are, you know, your Google's, Facebook's, A, there's no, they already are deep into building ML and they have all the frameworks. So it, it's hard to say, um, you know, what, what, what the advice that makes sense for them may not make sense for other companies, I guess, is one mm -hmm. key thing to be aware of. Yeah. Um, and so realistically, I would, I would break out a few different types of companies. So I would say, for your hyper growth technology companies that are more consumer facing or, you know, enterprise SaaS apps that are in the cloud from day one, those are kind of your modern technology stack companies. In many cases, those companies have good tracking in place. They're using some modern frameworks and tools. They have Kafka, they have things like that. Um, and they probably have good data ETL. Now it varies quite a bit. So some companies just, you know, move so fast that things are, you know, duct tape together, right? Even for, you know, successful startups. Um, but it tends to be the case that those companies at least have a lot of the raw pieces in place so that when they do get to a stage where they want to use machine learning to make their products better, um, you know, there's, there's some amount of work, but it's maybe one, one year, you know, 18 months of work to get things pretty solid. Um, I think the bigger challenge are more legacy companies or enterprise companies where, Organizationally, they're very large. The organizations may have different data systems. It's, it's typically hard in those companies to get access to data. Um, people may even hold on to data and not want to give it up without 10 meetings, right? Um, and even when you get the data, like the idea of getting the data means different things, right? So someone gives you a dump of data, which is static, is very different from, hey, we want to do this in production. We want to do a fraud detection we need, you know, a Kafka feed, we need, you know, you need all this uh, infra infra. Um, and so I think for those companies, my recommendation has been, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Like there are like 20 or 30 companies, um, you know, they see, so you see what Uber did with Michelangelo or what, um, you know, Salesforce is doing with Einstein. And there's like everybody trying to build their own ML platform internally. So that's like the wrong, when, when that typically happens with like the top down, guidance, hey, we need an AI strategy. Somewhere in those early discussions, they jump to the conclusion, oh, well, first we need to build our own AI framework and let's give that project a name. It's very much like, this happens a lot in software development in big companies. Let's come up with a name for the, it's name, project name driven development, right? They come up with a name, that'll be our infrastructure, you know, uh, uh, ETL system, let's go build that. Um, and, and that might take two years, right? I don't know, does this match what you're seeing? Uh, and big customers. Yeah, you know it's funny. I mean, you put the quote, uh, you put my my quote in the article, which I was um, was probably the tweet that has made fun of the most uh, for when I said basically big companies shouldn't build their own ML tools. And it's like, okay, like I am selling an ML tool, so it yeah. is. Uh, you know, like I feel um, like I'm incredibly biased, but it it is like I would say from my experience, it's just baffling how you, you go into um, you know, enterprise uh, companies in particular, I think, do this, and and they 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 build so much um, infrastructure that they could, you know, they could integrate like cheaply or for free. And it's it's actually funny because you go into like, um, you know, like a Google or Facebook, they've been around longer, yeah, and they actually pull in a lot more um, open source infrastructure than um, mm -hmm. you know companies less far along. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's always surprising and and. Um, and I, you know, I think part of it is actually that folks want to like sort of view building ML infrastructure inside a company as a little bit of a career, um, yeah. you know, development path. Like the incentives are. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think a big part of it is uh, incentives. So if you think about, um, and this isn't just Silicon Valley, I think this is all over, um, you know, PMs might be rewarded 
for OKRs and hitting the, the, you know, the product metrics, a lot of engineers are rewarded for releasing a new open source framework for, you know, giving a, a talk where, you know, there's some new infrastructure piece they built that everybody in the company is using. Um, and so I think that's for, you know, engineering and product leaders really need to think about what they're rewarding. Um, and, and one way to think about it maybe is reward leverage as well. So if I was in a situation where somebody made the choice to use, you know, an open source system or, or even to use a vendor and they delivered, you know, ahead of schedule and, you know, everything's working, you, you need to find a way to reward that as well as just rewarding, Hey, I took, I did a 18 month sprint to build something that is not as good as what I could get off the shelf. Right. Yeah, totally. totally. Um, but you know, it's also fun. I think the hard part, you, you also deal when you roll out to customers, you deal with the engineers on the ground. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there are good reservations around, you know, sometimes using a third party thing can make people uncomfortable. They don't feel like they can adapt it or change it to all their needs. Um, and so that's where I think the, a lot of the frameworks need to be really responsive to what a, cu what a customer needs um, and how flexible they are because, you know, I think we've all been in a situation where you use some third party thing and it's too rigid and then eventually, um, you know, it causes a lot of headaches. And it does seem like a lot of the tools and, and sort of um, infrastructure that comes out um, is built by a lot of engineers coming out of like Facebook and Uber and others. And they might not actually realize the different needs that um, other, other companies might have. Yeah. So I think that, 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 that part, when it comes to the infrastructure side, that's another common pattern is that people, um, so I, I worked with, uh, so Jay Kraps is the CEO of Confluent. Um, he was originally, he was my engineering partner back at LinkedIn when we were building, um, um, some of the data products we built and, um, he, he eventually went on, he, we had built a number of these things and then he said, he, he, his work on a lot of the infrastructure pieces and focus on that and what eventually became Kafka um, and, and other uh, open source projects grew out of, hey, we've built this four or five times now. I think this, we should abstract this out. So that's a very different approach than saying, hey, we've never done this, but let's go design what we think the right thing is and then build this abstract platform. So I think, I, I agree with him. I, I tend to think, things that grow out of real experience tend to be better uh, as terms of frameworks. Um, so if you're selecting, make sure you're selecting something that, um, as, you know, as a product manager or engineering leader, make sure that you know the origin of, <laughs> of the framework. <laughs> and like ideally, and if you're at these companies like yours building this, I mean, <laughs> one of the best things you can do is just see more problems um, and, and map what you're doing to those customer problems. We always end with two questions, and I'm 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 wondering how you're going to answer these. I think they're related to a lot of stuff we talked about, but but here's my first one, um, which is, um, what do you think's like the topic in you know data science or machine learning that people don't talk about enough, like the the kind of underrated thing that, in your experience, matters more than people um, spend time thinking about it. I think it's actually constructing good benchmarks. So Ooh, yeah, if, 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 um, if I were to look at, you know, we talked about teams that are struggling or having trouble, I would say nine times out of 10, they haven't done the hard work to construct a crisp, clean, precise benchmark, um, and in a val evaluation of how well their model is doing. Mm -hmm. And so what, what often happens is people have these notions, Hey, I'm going to build a recommender. Oh, I know how to do a recommender and Oh yeah, yeah, we'll get this data. And people actually just start building the model. Um, and then after the fact, maybe they label some like sample data and they say, Oh, this is my gold standard. Okay. This is how we're doing. And that that's maybe I'd, I'd say I, I, a lot of times people don't even do that. Right. They just launch the thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then it becomes very hard, or they may use proxy metrics, like did it increase lift? You know, did mm -hmm. it increase uh, CTR? And yep. the AB, AB test, AB testing is not a benchmark, basically, is what I would say. Um, so build the benchmark, be rigorous about it. And if at all possible, because the other thing that happens is when things aren't working, so say mm -hmm. you're six months in and your model isn't working, you don't know why, uh -huh. you need that benchmark so that you can debug what's going on. And if you don't have it, you're going to flail. It's funny. We had um, we had a guy uh, from OpenAI on the the podcast a while back, and he said the exact same thing. And he <laughs> said he was mentioning that 
the the Dota team spent like six months building like a hand tuned benchmark just to like say here's like sort of baseline rule based system. They really have spent like six months actually building the benchmarks. Yeah, um, I mean. I don't know the exact n- amount of time, but at our startup, I mean, I, I, w- I would almost say we spent 20 to 30% of our time on that kind of thing. Yeah. I think it totally makes sense. Um, all right, here, the second and last question. Um, when um, when you look at, oh, this is a good one for you, actually. So when you look at like all the ML projects you've seen, like consulted, been a part of, um, what do you think is the, the, the hardest part about getting them from like a, a model to like a production deployed model? Like like where's the the biggest bottleneck there? So a, from a working model? To... Yeah, from like, well, actually, no. I would say from from like sort of conception, like, so here's the goal to mm-hmm. deployed model that people can actually use. I would say the, the two, I'd say there's actually three hard parts. It's hard for me to pick just one. Um, I would say one hard part is around actually getting the data. So a lot of companies, uh, you're asking, where did we get the data for the startup? Mm-hmm. Even within companies that seemingly have a lot of data, getting the data set you need to train the model is often really costly and hard, and yep. there may be a lot of internal roadblocks. So that's one where I've seen people stumble. Um, the other hard part about getting things to production is is then actually the modeling approach. And so I don't believe like a lot of people out there. I, I see this all the time, you know, on, in blogs and on Twitter. Say, oh, the modeling doesn't actually matter that much. It's all these other auxiliary things, and it's commodity. I don't believe that. I don't believe modeling is commodity at all. I think it's actually really hard to get models to work correctly, um, and especially when you move beyond that toy or benchmark data set to real world data. Um, building something robust um, and that works at scale is actually really difficult. So I'd say um, that's the second part is actually the hard elbow grease and our research work of getting a working model is usually hard, harder than people think. Uh-huh. And then the last part I would say is um, actually getting getting buy-in, I would say, from executives. So th- this is a long journey to getting something out to production. And... Um, if you're running your own company and you're a CEO, that's one thing, and maybe you can push it through. Um, you think it's really important, but if you're in any large organization, there's a bunch of stakeholders, there's a bunch of business units, um, there's a bunch of engineering teams, kind of um, you know juggling resources. And you, re- I think, a lot of people struggle just to convince companies that it's actually a priority to push out their machine learning effort. Um, and and so I, th- I think a lot of that's where I'll go back and you know plug that product management article that I wrote. I think it's really important. You need somebody who's your advocate, who's like it could be like you know your head of data science or VP of data, or it could be like a product leader who's driving AI. But if you don't have a seat at the table at the exec table that's you know, believes in this and is really supporting it and pushing it, um, a lot of these things will die on the vine. Hmm, interesting. Cool. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. I like your awesome. garage. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>